Are you a sex worker looking to build a new website or a website redesign? Then you'll want to consider Fox Digital. They did a fantastic job designing my website, Stripped by Sia. If you want your website done, mention that you're a listener of the show at foxdigital.design for 20% off. Tell them I sent you. everyone, welcome back to another episode of Stripped by Sia, your podcast for strippers, sex workers, and all the fancy naked people in between. I am your host, Steph Sia, aka Kimchi on stage. Um, please don't ask me when I'll be on stage next, I actually don't know. I have not talked to my agent, so I need to get on that. It's my own reminder to myself. Um, but you can typically find me in some various clubs dancing on stage um, in Vancouver, Canada. Um, you can also find me in the interwebs as I am also a cam model, um, also an, an OnlyFans creator as well. I have some platforms you can find me if you, if you feel so inclined. Um, and I was also a sugar baby for many years before I started diving my and dipping my toes into other aspects of sex work. So if you are brand new here, because uh, we're just releasing a bunch of brand new episodes. Hello and welcome, first of all. Uh, second of all, um, yeah, this show is all about destigmatizing sex work. It is a uh, spicy topic for some, but unfortunately it is a lot of our realities as well, the stigma that comes with this line of work. And I believe it is part of my duty to educate people and humanize the work that we do and humanize sex workers because we are people and because it is a job as we will get into later today with our very, very fun topic that I have had to reschedule because of technical difficulties from last time, but I'm very excited to announce today's guest and to get into your conversation. But before we get into that, I just want to say hello to some of our Patreon subscribers. Just want to say a quick hello to Snoo Snoo. We've got Jay Sunsern, Justin Erickson, Ted McGuire, Geyser, Selena Money, Moxie Mayhem, Eric Rajo, people from North America, we've got people from Germany and Europe um, and Canada as well. So thank you so much for, first of all, trusting me with your dollars. Uh, just know that your money has gone to upgrading my new mic. Also trying to get some new equipment as well. So you as a listener will have a better listening experience and also to help fund my website as well, which isn't free. So if you want to find out more about that and all the fun exclusives you can get on Patreon like these um, video exclusive, getting episodes beforehand and whatnot. It's patreon.com slash stripped by Sia. And you can check it out. There's tiers starting at $4, going up to like 10. So um, I would say accessible for some if you have a little bit of extra pocket change and want to uh, support. Speaking of support, I also want to support those um, other podcasts and video casts that are on the network that I am on. Um, they are Skyhawk After Dark TV, and like I said, there are lots of other adult um, podcasts and shows that are similar to this one here as well. So if you are interested, go check them out at SkyhawkAfterDarkTV.com. And last but not least, I was talking about getting my website funded, um, or at least trying to get the hosting costs partially funded. Um, my website was made by a friend of mine. We got Anthony from Fox Digital, who helps create websites for sex workers or people that are in the industry. And he's offering 20% off for sex workers um, or that need a brand new website that perhaps need a remake on their website as well. Whatever you need, go contact him. It's foxdigital.design and he can sort you out over there. We made it here. I'm trying to get that nice and short as possible without boring everybody because we have much to talk about today. I don't have just one guest today. I actually have two guests on today that are going to be joining me in this conversation about decriminalization and activism in specifically the state of Vermont. And I know if you were listening back, I think in April is when we had Misha Montana that was lightly touching on this topic. But now I actually have people that we were talking about and the collective that was on that we were referencing all throughout the episode finally um, joining me on the show to give them to give us their perspective and to talk about the landscape that's happening in Vermont and why maybe there's so much movement there and momentum. So 
without further ado, please welcome to the show David Mickenberg, uh, who is a political lobbyist based in Vermont and also based in Vermont as well. We've got Henry from the Ishtar Collective, which is a nonprofit collective of sex workers, survivors, and industry allies in Vermont, which focus on intersectional social justice liberation. Hello, Henry. David. Hi. You made it. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> we're here we've figured out technology i'm so glad to finally have this conversation with you both yay <laughs> for your flexibility and thank you so much for having us yeah likewise we're so, so excited to be here yay. yeah <laughs> <laughs> really excited to talk about all the things today it's a large topic and we'll try to get this fitting all within the hour i will try to work my my magic somehow but maybe we can can get started with some proper introductions for both of you. Um, maybe David, if you want to go start, tell us a little bit about yourself, um, your line of work, and how you got here, and 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 why you wanted to help sex workers and specifically fight this fight. Sure. Yeah. It's so good to be here, um, especially with my good friend Henry. We are we are <laughs> companions and uh, compatriots in this effort here in Vermont, and we've done a lot of great work together and lots. Of lots more to come. Um, my involvement uh, in this effort to specifically decriminalize sex work, but also just work on behalf of sex worker rights really um, uh, stems out of my longtime work around uh, harm reduction and drug policy reform. Um, so for 20 plus years, I've been working in the area of drug policy whether it was cannabis reform or harm reduction um, uh, and variety of policies um, and sort of those principles of uh, non-criminalization approach to, uh, to issues in our society has stuck with me. And uh, this issue actually, um, I was inspired, my grandmother who has uh, passed away many years ago, but uh, talked to me about uh, the legalization, she called it legalization of prostitution or sex work many, many years ago and just felt like not only um, was it the right thing to do from a societal perspective, but right, the right thing to do from a human rights perspective. And so uh, that conversation sparked something in me. And as this movement began to grow, um, we sort of, me and my colleagues in Vermont started to think about what we could do here in our little state. We had done a lot of work on drug policy, continue to do that. Other sort of front edge um, social change uh, movements and uh, have been successful at that. And uh, three or four years ago, uh, sort of linked up with some folks nationally that have been working on this in the States. And ultimately quickly, Henry and I uh, found each other uh, in this effort and began our first uh, legislative effort in the state, which we can talk about um, after the intros or whatever. Um, and we've been going at it ever since. So it's been a lot of fun and we've made massive impacts to the point we know we're being successful when the opposition focuses a lot of its attention on what we're doing and we're seeing that now, so. Wow, that's awesome. That's really great. And also really cool that your grandma brought that up, like, and like very, very progressive of her as well. Very, very Absolutely. cool. Yep. Yeah. Henry, what about yourself? Tell us about you. Tell us about Ishtar Collective. Tell us all the things. <laughs> yeah, um, okay. Yeah. I'm Henry June Binks. I'm the co-founder and co-director of the Ishtar Collective. Um, the Ishtar Collective was conceived on the eve of um, the pandemic, actually. Uh, there was a bill being introduced to the state house prior to COVID-19's arrival to the state uh, pertaining directly to sex workers. And at the time, I had just come back from a long uh, voyage, <laughs> we'll say. I had been traveling and I had just returned to the States. Um, I was working at the liquor store, <laughs> I was just trying to figure out my next move when it came to my attention that this bill was hitting this, um, hitting the state house. And of course, being a sex worker, it begged the question, like, are they asking us 
what we think of this bill, are sex workers influencing this decision-making process at all? Um, I didn't have an organization, you know, uh, giving me access to the space. So it was a lot of cold calling state representatives to no avail until our co-director wandered into the liquor store and my co-director and I, it's like we could smell it on each other. There was no like clear indication, you know, that like other members of the community were in the space. It was just like, I don't know, like an energetic thing or something. I don't know. <laughs> and we got to talking, we conceived of the Ishtar Collective. Um, at that time, we thought we would just slap an organizational name on something. So we had access to the to the thing. Mm -hmm. Then COVID arrived and we switched gears a lot to more mutual aid and you know crisis mitigation um, in the States. The stimulus checks and like aid that was provided to most citizens um, when sex workers were written out of that as well. Right. So it became really important to us to make sure that we were in the front lines helping our peers survive through that. Right. Mm -hmm. um, all of this is informed. I guess I'm skipping steps. Um, I'm a second generation sex worker. My mother was a full service sex worker. I was conceived in a holy act of sex work. <laughs> Um, so a lot of my work is informed, you know, through my own experience and translating the experiences that my mother had as a sex worker in a previous generation that lived, I think, in steeper stigma than we experience even here today. We have the benefit of these like community pockets, you know, where we can exist in our authenticity. Not everybody has access to that, but I think it was a lot more rare when she was alive and when she was active in uh, in the industry so yeah dave and i um we linked up shortly after that we did start making legislative moves that we can talk more about after intros but we've been active for it's going to be four years in january um baptism through fire we've survived <laughs> uh, a global health crisis we're navigating a climate crisis with everybody I yes. think everybody's in that yes and this year vermont was hit by catastrophic flooding and still uh the whores endure so yeah <laughs> that's a lot yeah. it's a lot and and yeah. i think you also had like a lot of experience too with activism not just in vermont but also like prior in other states that you had lived before so it's great that you're still continuing on that journey and helping so many people and impacting so many people and 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 sex workers get to help benefit from both yours and David's efforts, which we're about to get into <laughs> the meat and the bones of the episode. Um, yeah. I mean, where, where did we want to start? Like maybe let's talk about Vermont and, you know, it's such a small state and why? Yeah. <laughs> like giving me the nods. Yes. Yes. It's a small state, but there's a lot of movement. Um, there's a lot of momentum there right now. Is that just something, is that by coincidence or is that you think maybe something that's really purposeful because we've driven it in that direction? Maybe we could start from there. Yeah, I think the reason we've been so successful is because our membership rocks. I'm not going to lie. Like Dave and I are here having this conversation, but we have a lot of help, right, from, from our members. And because we're comprised of people who have lived experience in the industry, you know, they have a stake in that. They care about it. They live the real consequences of stigma and criminal criminality day to day. Um, and we have the benefit of being like a small, tightly knit community. You know, it's 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 a blessing and a curse because it's a small and very rural state. It it's not as if we can just reestablish our scene. You know, like go and, and and plug into a different sect of the community it's very limited in this way so i think that we understand like we've had we've had the growing pains and experiences to establish that this is like a big picture issue and that we're laying foundational stones not just for our generation to experience benefits of destigmatization and hopefully decrim but we're also making investments for people in the future and I, I just, I can't sing the praises of our membership enough. I think that our membership 
has a lot to do with why we've been successful. I also think that we've had some pretty stellar players in the state house and that the larger community of Vermont has honestly moved and shocked me with their readiness to fold us in and have these talks and try to understand things that they haven't been exposed to before. But I'm sure Dave has some other theories as to why it's been working out. Too. Yeah, yeah, please share. <laughs> yeah, well, everything that Henry said and more, um, I think when we started this effort, you know, sadly, I, I say this, I've said this before, our first goal was to actually humanize human beings, which is sad that we have to do that in a public policy context. But the membership of the Ishtar Collective, Henry and others, allowed us to, you know, collectively <clears throat> put a face, a body, a soul, a mind to um, this public policy. And so the demonization, the stigma that had been utilized for years and years and years to prevent progressive change wasn't possible anymore because there was an actual human being with feelings, with families, with lives that are impacted by the words on these pages. So um, I think that, and because we're such a small state, you can't really hide from that, you know, like you're going to see this person, they're down the block, they're in your community, in the schools, in the, you know, everywhere it's, you know, sex workers and those that are supportive of sex, work, sex workers are, we're part of, of this small community contributing mightily. And I want Henry to talk maybe a little bit more later about what the Ishtar collective does beyond just advocating for sex work because it's amazing and so i think that type of work once people started to see that we they couldn't really um say no to change and so with that um and we strategically uh started to push legislation and local changes that allowed for that conversation to have allowed for uh, to put legislators and uh, local city council members in the uncomfortable position of having to hold up policies which dehumanized um, their neighbors. And so I think that's why we've been successful so far, in addition to everything that Henry was talking about. Yeah, amazing stuff. Like, I mean, if you look at other states, I mean, every state is different. Every state is unique in in tackling, and I'm using this in quotation marks if you can't see, um, tackling the topic of sex work and it being such a, again, quote unquote, spicy topic because a lot of the times, and we've had this conversation before on the podcast before, but talking about um, the conflation between sex trafficking and consenting consensual sex work. Um, and I know, David, we're talking earlier and we we're doing a little mic test, too, but we we're talking briefly about, you know, uh, what happened in Maine just recently uh, last month with them going through with the Nordic model, which is going to be, um, I guess, at the time of that this is episode will be released will be next month. So should be uh, bill becomes law in October. And um, as a Canadian where we also have the Nordic law, uh, the Nordic model present here, we know that that does not work. And that just pushes um, sex workers more at risk. Um, there's like le more risk available there and like less ways that people can screen and their safety is at risk. But why tell us to like in comparison to other states, what Vermont is doing different and why we are specifically pushing for decrim and and the history behind that? Because I know I read a little bit about this and you kind of mentioned it in the episode of Misha Montana, but you wanted to kind of propose a change um, in in one of the, legislat one of the legislations um, because it is a bit like outdated. But maybe let's talk about that and we can kind of slowly open up the book from there. <laughs> it's a big book. It sounds like you might be referencing the Burlington Charter change. Yes, um, the charter change. That was, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, you got it. Yeah, we can start there. Yeah. Um, so it came to our attention. A lot of the laws as they were written in Vermont, specifically around prostitution, you'll find antiquated, uh, very puritanical <laughs> language. Um, the, the kind of ways of talking that we haven't really utilized openly as a society for, I would 
gander about 100 years. Um, so our prostitution law, first and forthright, um, its language creates, it, it suggests, it uses terminology as such, indiscriminate sex as as something that counts as prostitution it doesn't necessarily say that that indiscriminate sex has to be a transaction of services and resources it's suggesting that intercourse out of wedlock it could be conflated with prostitution so that's the kind of like as far as like speaking legally is that's the kind of atmosphere that we're working with right just like very old haven't been visited or prioritized for a long time puritanical problematic language incredibly gendered so we found that was a thing in burlington and we proposed a charter change to strike down the language of course there was some pushback from folks out of state um but not the voters otherwise that wouldn't have happened, right? That language wouldn't have been struck down. But at that time, the language was as thus, and I quote, uh, the city council retains authority to punish and suppress common prostitutes and those consort houses of ill fame and those consorting therewith. And that language is just violent. It's, it's incredibly misogynistic. It refers to people in the sex industry as common prostitutes. Like I, my jaw hit the floor when I read it the first time. Um, and so what we wanted to do when we proposed striking this language down was a, a first move in challenging our neighbors to acknowledge our humanity past, you know, the sex is a very triggering matter for a lot of people. You know, if even if you're a person that doesn't live with trauma around this matter, we do live in a larger society that censors sensuality and stigmatizes, especially for feminized bodies, people in the queer community, marginalized communities in general. There are lots and lots and lots of people that are discouraged from expressing their sexuality openly and fluidly. We just live in a place that says so. So when we wanted to strike this language down, we were asking our neighbors to make space for us as well. And it was, I think, you know, in my mind, the intentions that I had behind that were establishing first steps in a larger conversation to kind of demystify the portraiture of a consensual adult sex worker. And so we could start, you know, it was almost like, so during these hearings, um, our opposition, if you will, uh, people who see things a little differently than than we do they came and they had some really spicy things to say they said if we struck down this harmful language um there was one lady who said that people would be selling sex toys on the waterfront and you know they were suggesting that <laughs> it was, it so was gonna, burlington was going to be the sex the sex trade capital of the world or something like that yeah very that people would <laughs> that they were going to be like prostitution tourists flocking to Vermont. And I'm happy to say that it's been more than a year since that charter change was passed. And we have seen zero evidence of that. There hasn't been like a notable uptick in, in, in that kind of activity. All that's happened is that harmful language has been put in the garbage where it belongs mm -hmm. and adult consensual sex workers and survivors alike too don't have to feel the brunt of that stigmatization. And that was the operative point of that entire thing. Mm -hmm. um, Dave was also there though, and he can talk a little bit more about like the inner workings and mechanics. Yeah. I'm here to gap. Yeah, you know, no, I would love to hear about that too, <laughs> for sure. Well, we're, we're, <laughs> we'll cut to the end of the vote. We were so happy that the charter change passed by 69% of the voters in uh, in, this, yeah. in Burlington, yeah. <laughs> That's uh, awesome. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, that was, that was the, we had previously passed legislation in Vermont, I think it was the first in the country. Um, and this is where advocacy, you know, is a powerful thing. It was Henry's first time testifying in the legislature. And with that testimony, completely won over the key committee to pass that bill. And that was our first foray into humanizing sex work and sex workers to say that if you were, you found yourself in a situation and you needed to 
call the police that you would be able to do so without being prosecuted, not just for sex work, but for possession of drugs and other things. So, um, and we were able to get that legislation passed and it started us on this path. The opposition didn't show up really until uh, the Burlington Charter change. And I was, I was floored by, you know, the same folks that were leading the charge in Maine that have been uh, pushing um, uh, changes all over the country um, showed up um, from mostly from out of state, uh, frankly, mostly from New York and Massachusetts and other places. Um, and they use some of the most extreme rhetoric that I've ever heard in my life, uh, bringing survivors out and uh, talking about the extreme circumstances and really were, I, I thought, um, uh, very aggressive in their opposition. And luckily we were able to turn to folks that actually live in these communities to, to, and who are involved in, um, in sex work to be able to say, well, that, that may be your experience, but our experience here is that this language creates stigma and stigma is harmful and can be dangerous and deadly, frankly. Um, and so luckily the city council and the Burlington voters, and then ultimately the legislature and the governor supported that change. But, um, but what we saw, and you talked about reference to Maine, we saw this very powerful, well-funded opposition that now is on a campaign throughout um, throughout the United States and frankly throughout the world to um, to install what we call the entrapment model or the Nordic model, um, and it's this sort of interesting coalition between uh, feminist prohibitionists and uh, sort of what I've seen is sort of the right wing evangelical anti sex movement uh, and it's a pretty scary combination um, and has been effective. And I think we need to start, um, not start, continue to talk about it and talk about it. And I'm so glad, Steph, that you brought up uh, your experience in Canada, the failures of the Nordic model. And we see study after study coming out now saying that uh, the Nordic model makes things, um, and arguably I've heard this argue that even more dangerous than full criminalization, you know, because at least with criminalization, there's a balance of power between, uh, you know, the clients and, and the workers. But um, when that in, there's an imbalance created, that that is a dangerous situation for folks, as you were talking about. So um, what we saw in little Burlington, Vermont, city of, you know, 30,000, 40,000 was this global effort to um, push back on a human rights movement, and I and I know I'm, now I'm getting, you know, speech of speechy. But one thing I say it's 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 interesting that that Maine happened um, because uh, they did that in the face of virtually every single leading human rights organization in the world. We're talking about Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, the Open Society Institute. Group after group after group of human rights organizations have said that decriminalization is the most effective tool to keep people safe. Even the leading anti-trafficking organizations, particularly the leading anti-trafficking organizations, have said that to get at trafficking, which we are all opposed to, obviously opposed to sex trafficking, um, but to really tackle that issue, full decriminalization is what's necessary. And so... Um, it feels odd to be on the defensive when the data, the studies, the support, public health data, and all of that is supportive of our efforts. And I think we need to turn that around and really start to, to push back on this very um, scary movement. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, and it is a movement. It is, uh, as you mentioned, very scary indeed. Um, and you said like a de very deadly mix, a very... Um, yeah, I just I, the stuff that I see out there, like on Twitter, and I don't like to follow those organizations. Um, but I just I'm curious to see like what what they're saying and stuff. And we were kind of talking about this earlier too. Uh, but the argument is basically, yeah, there. Why would anyone choose sex work? It's either you are trafficked or like you. Why would anyone want to be in this line of work? But as you've seen, a lot of us are 
in this line of work <laughs> and we're doing so safely and and like at the end of the day it is a profession and one that hopefully one day will be respected and validated with uh, workings like yours so i'm really hoping that again like more of this the goodness will, will come out of movements that you guys are really, really pushing for. Um, but obviously it takes a lot of work to get there. <laughs> You're like, yes, we're nodding. Um, maybe we can talk about some of the, some of the inner working, some of the mechanisms involved um, to get behind um, like what we are fighting for here. I don't know if you, either one of you want to jump in. <laughs> Sure, I can <laughs> kick it off. Yeah, yeah. kick us off. Sure, man. I keep starting. Don't be yeah, no, shy. I'll, I'll start off. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, it, a lot of this is interesting. It, like this incremental change, which has been powerful um, and meaningful, I think starts with sort of ideas that are generated from folks' real lives. You know, um, we passed a bill this past session. Uh, banning uh, investigatory sex by law enforcement. So uh, what that means is that law enforcement, uh, well, I'll back up a couple years ago, uh, the legislature passed a bill banning custodial sex, meaning that law enforcement cannot have sex with people in their custody. custody. Amazing that we even need to have laws like that. But the fact is, is that they don't exist. Those bans do not exist in a lot of places and uh custodial sex by law enforcement happens you know uh, i'm not saying it happens with regularity but it happens and uh one thing we saw that was lacking in our laws is um is a ban on um, law enforcement having sex with people they're investigating because of the power dynamic there so right. um, we moved forward and uh, was able to pass one of the leading sort of most forward looking laws in the country on that. So it's sort of ideas are generated and then bills are drafted and we go about forming coalitions of advocates and groups supporting us with uh, coalitions of legislators that are willing to take on these issues. And it's just really like in the trenches, in the streets, in hearings, testifying, doing the hard work of organizing and getting you know, letters to the editors and op-eds and interviews. And Henry and I had a press conference. It was negative. Am I allowed to swear on this? Yeah, of course. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it was negative oh fucking 50 degrees out. And it was like oh two of us and a podium and a sign. And But we got press and there was people covering our efforts. And so it's a willingness to be in the streets and in the halls where policy is being made that that really um, allows this to move forward. And it's a person by person effort. It's a legislator by legislator. It's, you know, reporter by reporter. It's, you know, podcaster by podcaster. We'll, we are willing to talk to whomever is willing to listen and um, help to advance this human rights effort. So I think that's a lot of what it is, just growing, building upon the good work that's happened in the past and uh, pushing it to the next level. And we're always looking for new ideas and new policy changes, not just full decriminalization, which is our ultimate goal, um, but you know, incremental change. And frankly, uh, we have a lot of common cause with our opposition. We want to make sure that people are protected. We want to push back on sex trafficking and non-consensual sex, of course. And in fact, we want to make sure that, for instance, Henry and I were talking today for like unemployment insurance, right? Like sex workers during the pandemic here, independent contractors and other trades were able to access for the first time or very, you know, infrequently unemployment insurance, right? Sex workers weren't able to access unemployment insurance. I mean, it's things like that. We invite our opposition to join with us to help ch make changes like that, to empower and make sure that people have the protections of the law, um, despite whether they have a moral judgment of what somebody's profession is or not. So those are, Henry, you wanna build on that. That's kind of the nuts and bolts of, uh, 
of our, of, from my perspective. Yeah. Well, yeah, I think, I mean, um, I think also, you know, because of when we started and like what we decided to do at the time of our conception, you know, there was, there were community members in need and vermont is a very like community centric state it's a language that people speak here you know uh people are very for better or for worse we're really involved in each other's business you know <laughs> <laughs> and sometimes that pans out in the way that sounds predictable under like a functioning you know day in the life i suppose when everything's intact the way working the way it's supposed to but for the last three years that really hasn't been the case so, you know, what these small, tight knit communities look like, even now, as I, as I'm talking to you, I live in Montpelier and Montpelier was one of the places that was rocked deepest by this most recent flood on July 11th, you know, and it today I saw community members continuing to rebuild the downtown district. It's just something that seems as someone who's only lived here for the last 10 years, relatively short stay okay <laughs> it seems like it's something that's incredibly important to the people who live in this state that community members are showing up for each other and like living this very hands-on truth investing in each other's wellness and when we started that was important to me too i honest to god would not be alive today if not for the kindness of other people investing in my wellness when i needed it and that's just the truth you know my ownness is to repay that and and to like demonstrate what i've learned through those experiences right and i don't think i don't think that we would have seen so much success if we hadn't had the opportunity to rip off all the labor labels and exist in a time of crisis with our neighbors as people honestly i think that that made all the difference we had to really simplify and boil things down to basic needs and how can I help you? And that was how we introduced ourselves as an organization. Wow. Truly, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it was just like this very mutual struggle. And I like our first fundraiser was in the height of COVID. It was an internet streamed concert. Oh, wow. <laughs> Fun. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. We, yeah. We like pulled some neighbors from a venue that I used to work door at who did a, like a streaming service on the side. And it was really, it was just like knocking on, you know, or not, you couldn't really knock on people's doors at that time, <laughs> but you know, getting a hold of your neighbors and saying like, look, I'm working on this project. That's important to me. Do you want to tap in for it? And that's how the thing happened. And that's, that's to the day, like our mutual aid program, we have a food justice, um, committee and program. I'm happy to say we've been cultivating a third of an acre of produce for free distribution across community lines. It's not just for sex workers. It's like, are you, are you hungry? I love that. That's, that's it. That's, that's, that's all we want to know. You need some food. We got it, you know, but that land is leased out to us on the basis of just feeding neighbors. And it's, and it's a neighbor that's invested in facilitating care where they have resources and otherwise we wouldn't, you know? And I, I mean, I gotta love Vermont for that. And I think that like the reason that, you know, we've been able to kind of make it through various crises and, and the reason we were able to challenge Burlington to make this hard decision that was like uncomfortable for some folks, you know, mm -hmm. it's not like Vermont, when you think of Vermont, you're not like, this is the sex work capital of the United States. Okay. <laughs> like it's like, I think of the Shire because it very much feels like that, you know, it's like Hobbit territory. People are like eating cheese and like drinking maple syrup and like a bunch of grumpy old farmers everywhere. And I love it. It's super wholesome, but it's not like very sexy. So we were asking people to, to like leave their comfort zone with us and just like trust us on this. You just got to trust us. Okay. If you just take this language out, we promise no one's going to start like hawking dildos on the side of the road. <laughs> And we, and we, and the thing is, is like, we do have a lot of common ground with the opposition, but one thing that we don't have in common is that we don't leave when we pressure policy decisions. We've been here to see through the consequences of the policy that we endorse. Mm -hmm. We've been here to see through 
every decision that we've lobbied for, period. We haven't gone anywhere. We don't, we don't just pop in and give unsolicited advice. <laughs> you know, we, we're invested from a place of experiencing life in Vermont alongside our neighbors. And that's, I think, that's one, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> no, that's great to hear. And it, yeah. like Vermont sounds awesome. It just sounds like I need to visit at this point. Like, <laughs> very like community driven though, and and I think that's so important. And just um, amongst like the sex work umbrella as a whole, we all know that how important community is. Um, yes, <laughs> you're just like yes, you got that right. Um, it, it's very true because uh, our work can be very isolating at times. Uh, oh, I, I don't know for myself can be isolating a lot of the time and without the support of others, without support from the community, it makes it really, really difficult and challenging to be in this space. Um, especially for those that are doing survival work, like, and it's their only job, like it's, it makes it really, really, really hard. So I commend the work both, um, Henry, you and David are, are doing for the community there. I'm curious, um, because, yes, we are speaking in Vermont, obviously, in those terms. But what about on the national level? What can we see on that forefront? Um, and and as, as I said earlier, all every state is different. They're all doing something different as well. But, I mean, potential outcomes. Maybe people can look to Vermont in the future as something that you can work towards. Let's open that conversation. Yeah, I think it's a mixed bag what's going on across the states right now. Um, Oregon was recently within a hairline of like a really important victory, uh, you know, in terms of sex work legislation, but unfortunately it was vetoed. Um, yeah, you know, so it's, it's you know, the, the stigma still exists out there. I think that honestly, our communities should be ready to continue to have these really hard conversations where we feel like maybe we're on the defensive, right? Um, where we're faced with the conflation of our consensual labor to exploitation. Um, if, you know, you brought that up earlier in in this in this conversation. Indeed, like that is you know that that is an obstacle we continue to face, and I think that sex work organizers across the states deal with that we're also dealing with just an overall changing political climate that's kind of scary right um yeah there's a lot of anti-queer legislation going on there's the erasure of um like a hot take our racist history right yes in curriculums down in florida mm -hmm. yeah there's an actual second wave of whitewashing going on that's super spooky yeah so you know, it's it's hard to tell what's going to happen on a national level. Sometimes when I think about things in terms of that way, I get really fucking overwhelmed. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. And so I try to like scale back. Like for me, I try to be ultra, ultra concentrated on our region and like what's within our control. You know, we see we see a national trend that's really deeply concerning. There are lots of intersections with um, the experience of being a sex worker and the experience of being a queer person. Mm -hmm. I live on that intersection myself, right? Mm -hmm. And so, like for me, you know, I can speak to I can speak to regional movements that have been made because it feels like that's like in my parameters. But what's most important to me, while we have this sort of chaotic political trend across the states, not just with sex work organizing, but just period is like, how do we establish safe places, right? Because we have a lot of people being displaced by these political changes. And that's what I'm most invested in now is like people are going to be looking for a safe place. And if we can make sure that Vermont is one of those spots, then I will be satisfied. Yeah. Yeah, do. Absolutely. Because yeah. like, I know that you, um, if I can share that, you, I think you also lived in New Mexico as well and New Orleans. Yeah. Can you talk a yeah. little bit like <laughs> what that landscape is like over there for those who are listening? How are those spaces? Yeah. I, well, I cut my teeth as a sex worker in Albuquerque, New Mexico, actually. Hey. That's where it all began. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, my still to the day, I don't know if the club's still open, but if, you, you know, if it is and you are ever passing through Albuquerque, uh, knockouts, I just love it there. It's a good <laughs> spot. Um, yeah. And living in New Mexico, 
as a sex worker, you know, honestly, it wasn't, I didn't experience stigma because I, I existed in my like bubble of stripper siblinghood. I just mm-hmm. rolled, like we, we rolled deep everywhere we went. So I didn't really, you know, it, where there was horophobia, it was, it was like hard to acknowledge, you know, safety and numbers type vibes. It was a really positive experience. And it actually kind of like was the beginning of un- unraveling my own internalized misogyny and like my own horophobia. You know, yeah. I didn't realize until those experiences came to me that hanging out with other femmes could be so fucking cool. <laughs> I did not know that. I was definitely <laughs> the Kool-Aid of like, you know, girls are crazy. You got to stay away from them, whatever. I really was you know, and that changed a lot. So I will say that like the clubs down there, um, I did see like typical activities that like, I think that you would observe in other clubs as being like problematic, like, you know, like security being like bribed by clients or just actively disregarding the safety of the people that they're hired to protect, that kind of shit. But I don't think that that's unique to New Mexico by any stretch. That's just across the board. (laughs) <laughs> it's just a problem that we need to handle. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And in New Orleans, again, I, I experienced a lot of deep solidarity there, but I was also dancing there at a time where it was rumored that Disney was purchasing um, the French Quarter and there were all of these raids. Yeah, it was wild. It was okay. Look, the first night I was, I went, I was living with, um, a stripper sibling of mine who's still just an angel. I just, I love them so much. And it was our first night working in this club. Our first night, first hour, and a SWAT team came in on a liquor license raid. I can't make this shit up. So they detained all, they rounded us all up and put us in like the table dance section, you know? like the economy seating for the private dances and like ran everybody's ID, disappeared a couple dancers, disappeared a couple workers, of course, you know, and held us at gunpoint for like hours. That's scary. Like, and just on, on, on liquor code violations. And we were not the only club that got raided. They were doing it to every club that was not corporately owned. So like barely legal hustlers, they were okay. Right. But the clubs that were run, by like local generational families or people who have just been invested in New Orleans culture since like before Katrina, those people were shut down and those people were held at gunpoint and the dancers working there within. So the clubs that catered to people of color Mm. were shut down. And these acts of violence were perpetuated in these small local like gem establishments, really cool spots. And there, some of those places are just gone. Yeah. So I'll say that there was like a robust organizing effort that I saw in Louisiana and New Orleans in particular in response to all of this, Mm -hmm. but the larger societal um, tones were scary. Yeah. They were interested in developing the French Quarter and making it a wholesome, um, like weird diet version of itself. I cannot imagine that. And (laughs) erasing. Right. Because it's Bourbon Street. Like literally that was like brothel town. That's like part of the. The, the city's history yeah. you can't make it go away <laughs> <laughs> like everyone and their mom has been naked and thrown up on that street you can't erase that no. okay <laughs> like, <laughs> wow. but it was you know it, there was a the experience it had yeah it held a, a bit of duality i guess you know safety and numbers again but i think that again i don't think that's unique to the place I think that it's part of this like larger thing that we are confronting yeah right definitely sorry David we're going back to you as well (laughs) we didn't forget about you (laughs) it's a bit of story time there but yeah going back to that question about like um, what do you think on like the national scale what can we expect from Vermont what can we expect in the future what are your thoughts on that yeah I mean it was interesting in 2020 uh, our um, presidential election, uh, there were a number of presidential candidates that supported publicly, at least considering the decriminalization of sex work. Folks like Kamala Harris, Cory Booker, Elizabeth Warren. And so um, that sort of felt uh, like positive momentum that there were folks that were running for president that saw this as a human rights issue. Uh, and and that that felt good. Federally, though, um, I think 
when SESTA FOSTA was passed, which, uh, you know, I think theoretically well intended, but in practicality, a disastrous consequences, you know, and it's similar mentality to what we are seeing uh, around this Nordic model movement, um, this entrapment model, we call. Um, uh, so I think federally, um, I don't see, you know, given the divide in the country, I don't see a lot of movement in, in the direction, the human rights, uh, progressive change direction that, that we would support. And I think what we're probably trying to do is prevent, you know, bad legislation like that from, from cropping up again. Um, uh, and so uh, I think the, the, the fight right now is on a state level. Um, and interestingly, the Northeast where we live uh, New England and New York and other places is sort of the epicenter of that conversation right now. Um, and so uh, we saw what happened in Maine. We'll see what happens in Vermont uh, in the coming years. New York has competing legislation. Um, and, um, you know, it's a it's an uncomfortable place to be the leading champion in Maine for their bill was a sort of icon of, of feminist politics uh, in, the, in the state of Maine. And generally, I think the folks that, that we are allied with would agree on a lot of the issues that she stands for. But um, this sort of alliance that has taken hold, um, I think is, is really counter to accepted principles of human rights. And, I, and so I think from a federal perspective, I, I don't see broad scale progressive change happening, um, just given the nature of the divisions in our country and most parts of our country. And I think where we are going to see change, it's going to be in places uh, where there's they're at least open to having the conversation. And then we'll have to have the, the further next level conversation about which model uh, is actually supported by um, public health uh, you know, and, uh, and human rights. Uh, so it's pretty, uh, it seems pretty dim in terms of a national effort, but I do think, um, we need to, one of the areas that, and I just wanted to bring up is this sort of the, the bringing legal sex work and, uh, what's currently illegal sex work together and making sure that we are supporting each other, because certainly we know that, um, that the efforts to sort of end legal consensual sex work, uh, whether it's stripping or, or, you know, adult films or, you know, I mean, you all have taught me and know all the different versions of that better, but, um, but that is, goes hand in hand with the effort to, to stop momentum around um, decriminalizing sex work. Uh, fully. Uh, and so I think what we can do in the advocacy community is really join forces. And that's why it was so great to see, to hear Misha on your sh show, who I've gotten to know a little bit and others uh, in the um, in the legal sex work um, world, really joining forces with other advocates uh, like what we're doing in Vermont. So that I think we need to do, and we can do that nationally and we can do that internationally you know this really has to be an international human rights movement uh that supports people's right to do what they want with their bodies as long as it's consensual uh and as long as they're adults and it's really as simple as that so yeah definitely and that's such a great way to kind of wrap up this conversation as well i mean yeah I, you summed up beautifully david and uh, thank you both so much for sharing your expertise, your knowledge, um, just your collective efforts and bringing it to the forefront here on the show because I'm always curious to see like what's happening on this side of the country, what's happening on this side of the world. And it's very inspiring to hear that. Um, I guess like my last kind of kind of questions for both of you is, and you can, whoever can answer first, whatever, I'm easy. But for anyone else that is wanting to get more involved with activism, with advocacy, 
or with any kind of like policy and legislation work, like where, where does one go? What are, what's your kind of your advice? Mm. <laughs> Threw that one That's out really there. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, I'll, I'll kick it off and then Henry can fill in the, I mean, at least in the States, you know, I mean, there are, you know, for instance, American Civil Liberties Union has, has been a longtime supporter of efforts around decriminalization. Um, you know, there are places, human rights, seek out human rights organizations uh, in your states that are doing this work. Almost every state, uh, you know, has a chapter, say you're interested and realize that literally one, I mean, it sounds cheesy and cliche, but literally evidence by Henry's efforts, one person can make a massive impact, you know? And so understand that um, just getting involved um, is, is the start and you can make change. And so find, you know, the organization or the other individuals put, do a meetup somewhere who wants to change policy around sex work in my community. And you'll find people that are interested in that and just start building out from there. Um, but yeah, that would be my, my first step. There are organizations too that um, are trying to establish like support networks for people who want to be politically activated. Um, I can't name all of them, um, but one that I turn to for guidance um, is New Moon Fund. I think that they're a really spectacular organization. Um, I can't speak too much to exactly like everything that they do, but I've benefited a lot from my exposure to their work. Um, and they're definitely worth investigating. There are also like resources online. You can go to Decriminalized Sex Works website and there are kind of like what you might call like cheat sheets or quick information resources to help introduce a person to like this language and these concepts, right? To kind of build that that confidence and that expertise you name around what advocacy would look like. Because I think like one of the challenges is like like, you know, of course, if you're if you're a sex worker and you're outing yourself in a house of legislation, there's a risk analysis that should probably take place there too, you know? Um, and that should absolutely be named. It's a it's it's a big it's a big deal. <laughs> yeah. But also it you are confronted with with opposition and and static, right? And so having like these resources to kind of keep in your pocket so that you feel sound and confident when you're having these hard conversations has like done me a world of good. And then of course, you know, find friends. Mm -hmm. Find friends who want to do it with you. Yeah, it makes it a little bit easier, right? Yeah, yeah for yeah. sure. Well, um, this has been a fantastic conversation. I feel like we get there's so much to talk about too, but I also respect the time <laughs> and considering this the second round of trying to do this interview. Also, big thank you to Ariella Maskowitz, who from who's from Decriminalized Sex Work for helping organize <laughs> to get you two onto the show. Thank you. Thank you for making this happen. Um, but before I let both of you go, can you let us know where people can find you if you want to be found? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> You know, cloak and dagger over here, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you can find the Ishtar Collective. At, I need to make sure there's a video game website that has a very similar web uh, web address, and so <laughs> I've had to learn the hard way. Be careful about where I'm sending people. Yes. <laughs> but <laughs> if you're not into gaming, that's not going to be for you. <laughs> so if you want to learn more about the Ishtar Collective, you would just type up Ishtar Collective dot org ishtar is spelled i-s-h-t-a-r you can also find us on instagram ishtar collective vt with that little circle a in front of it like you do um and if you're curious and if people you know have inquiries for us directly you can email us at info at ishtar collective dot org perfect <laughs> you, you can find me uh my law firm uh, email if uh, anyone wants has 
stories or interested in this issue in other states, you can email me at david at mickdunn, M-I-C-K-D-U-N-N.com. Awesome. Well, thank you both so much for the lovely chat and opening up this conversation. I'm, I'm happy to bring this to my platform and also just spread the word this way as well. And if anyone else has questions or comments about the episode, please reach out. Um, you can also, I'll, I'll, I'll be tagging everyone on Twitter as well. Um, David, maybe not you, but <laughs> um, Henry, yes. <laughs> but we can definitely start some threads on there. Um, I am stripped by Sia on Twitter. On Instagram, I'm I am now stripped by Sia podcast. My old my old Instagram stripped by Sia is now gone. So please follow. Um, that would help because now I'm back in the hundreds as opposed to the thousands of followers. Um, if you do want to support the show financially, again, it's Patreon.com/slash Stripped by Sia. And if you do want to be on the show, if we have a fantastic uh, topic that you'd like to bring to the forefront, please pitch me at strippedbysia.com. I'd love to hear your episode topic, come pitch me. I am really interested in hearing all the topics you want to bring to the forefront here, but. Come alas. to Vermont too. And come yeah. to Vermont. Yeah. Yes, it is now on my list. It's one of the states I haven't visited yet. So I ha- definitely need to go. I'm supposed to be on the East Coast next year, but we will see how far on the East Coast I will be. (laughs) But for everyone else listening, if you don't want to hear about those travel plans, it is new episodes every single Sunday dropping at midnight Pacific Standard Time. And yeah, there'll be new episodes coming at you all next week. For now, David, Henry, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're listening to Stripped by Sia, hosted, produced, and edited by Steph Sia, music by Ted D, graphic design by Maria Bellandarama, and photography by Ian Davern.